Number seven ministries. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed. Number seven ministries. Welcome to Number 7 Ministries Christian Outreach. Today's sermon is called Seven Signs of a False Prophet. And we're going to expose some characteristics of how to recognize a false prophet. The first sign or indication that we have a false prophet is a false prophet will completely deny the deity of Jesus Christ. So, a false prophet will try to dethrone the deity of Jesus Christ. They will try to take away the fact that Jesus was God. And you have a lot of religions that are acting under the false prophet's spirit by saying that Jesus was just a man. Of, a man. He was just a prophet. So they're saying he was prophesying, but he wasn't the son of God. They will say that he was gifted, he performed miracles. They have no problems uh, uh, acknowledging those things. But when it comes to recognizing his deity, him being a son of God, they will try to dethrone him and strip him of that. A lot of religions that do that with Jesus are uh, the Muslims will do that. The Muslims will acknowledge that Jesus uh, did miracles, that he was a prophet, that God used him, but they will dethrone the deity of him the fact that he was God himself. The same thing with uh, the Jewish people. The Jewish people will recognize that Jesus was a prophet, that he was gifted, but again, they will dethrone the deity. And you have a lot of uh, proclaiming Christian churches that will say Jesus is great, he uh, was used mightily of God, but he's not the only way to heaven. See, these are uh, signs of what a false prophet will do. So they, they might, uh, everything in the outward appearance will look like a Christian organization. They could use uh, King James Bibles. They can pray. They can uh, even use Jesus' name in their prayers. But in their teaching, in their preaching, they will not acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. They will reject that. And so this is, this is the number one key for us to know of a, a sign that we're dealing with the false prophet. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, it says, But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So look at how that Bible verse was written. It said, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. So this is telling us that the spirit of the Antichrist, or the false prophet, is existing in this world today. He or she or this spirit is already opera in operation right now. But it's also saying that this spirit is going to be coming to or you heard that it's coming because this spirit is going to climb the ladder of spiritual wickedness in high places. He's, this spirit is going to climb the ladder of political position. This spirit is going to climb the ladder of the entertainment industry. So that this spirit of Antichrist can influence masses of people. He's going for the gusto. Yeah, is he going to go into the nitty gritty uh, crevices of small churches and big churches and try to influence there? Yeah, he's all throughout the world. And this is why as Christians, we need to know and be aware of signs 
that indicate that this is a false prophet so we don't get deceived and we don't get misled because the ultimate goal of the Antichrist is to lead people to hell. Lead people to hell. Number two, a, a second sign of a false prophet is teaches contrary to what Jesus taught. So here you have, um, in the first sign, they deny the deity of Jesus, but you can also deny the deity of Jesus by teaching against what Jesus taught. So if someone, if Jesus said it's, uh, it's better to give than to receive, and someone teaches the opposite of that, then they're actually operating on the spirit of Antichrist by teaching the opposite of what Jesus taught. And those that are into satanic cults, those that are uh, devil worshipers, in their rituals of Satanism, part of their practice is to do the opposite of what the Bible teaches, to read the Bible backwards to do exactly the opposite of what Jesus taught. So this is another indication to recognize that we are dealing with a false prophet. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, or chapter 6, verse 3, if any man teaches otherwise and consists not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So this is a, a, a Bible verse that is indicating the extreme importance that we embrace the teachings of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you this, that anyone who feels the need to go to an outside source outside of the Bible and to uh, preach off of that it, that's, you're, you're going in the, in the direction of a false prophet because you're, you're saying that the teachings of Jesus were not enough, that we have to go to an outside source. Indirectly, when you start to use different sources outside of the Bible, you're starting to take on the spirit of a false prophet. Because I've found through personal experience that the teachings of Jesus Christ are more than adequate, more than adequate to deliver addictions, more than adequate to cast out demons, more than adequate to save our souls, more than adequate to comfort us, to guide us, to lead us, to direct us, and to give us the ability to discern evil from good. The words of Jesus Christ are more than adequate. So for us to start being prideful and saying that we've mastered the words of Jesus and now we're above the words of Jesus, that we need to use other sources outside of the Bible, this person is so lifted up in pride that they're being counterproductive and God is already rejecting them. So let's humble ourselves and let's be wise and fear the Lord, fear Jesus and believe that his words are sufficient. So as of now, we have uh, the two signs of a false prophet. We have denies the deity of Jesus. We have number two, teaches contrary to what Jesus taught. And then we're going to get ready to go into the third sign. The third sign of a false prophet is that he or she has the love of money. And let me tell you, when a false prophet has the love of money, uh, their whole entire life will be perceived from the basis of the love of money. This is how a false prophet is able to preach from Genesis to Revelation about money. Every single scripture that they preach, they somehow put a twist in it and they bring it back to money. And they will start to glorify the power and the value of money above the power and the value of Jesus Christ. And anytime you see someone doing that, you know that you're dealing with a false prophet. Because the Bible does not value money over Jesus. The Bible never says that money in and of itself is evil. It says that the love of money is evil. And those that are false prophets have the love of money.
And that is good. Now, again, remember, a false prophet could just have one or two of these signs. And in order for a false prophet to be most effective, he will probably only have one of two of these signs. Because if he has all of these signs, people will recognize them and just shut down. And he won't be able to manipulate anyone. So the devil is very, very crafty. Very, very crafty. And let's, le let's read the proof in the Bible. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Perverse, which means corrupt or evil, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, which means absence from the truth, or empty of the truth, or not having any truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. The Bible right here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, it says, those that suppose godliness is gain. In other words, they connect with the more money you have, the more godly you are. They try to say the more materialism you have, the greater your bank account is, the more blessed you are. But the Bible is teaching that that is not true. And it actually tells us that those that teach those sort of things, we should actually leave their presence because they are not of God. Do, do, does, it, does it feel good to our flesh? Yes. Does the flesh want to hear that because you are uh, of God, you're going to get more and more money? Yes, the flesh wants to hear it. Yes, it feels good. Yes, it encourages us. But it encourages us away from Jesus. Remember, Jesus was born in a barn. Jesus was born in the most poorest of poor places, and he was the epitome of God. He was God. And so if we say that uh, 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 godliness is gain, then we're saying that Jesus was ungodly because he was born in the poorest of places. The, the two cannot go together. Can a person be rich and be of God? Yes, but he is not proven to be of God because of his riches. He is proven to be of God because of his relationship with Jesus Christ and that alone. Whether he's poor or rich is irrelevant from a relationship and a commitment to Christ. Now, the devil has the means and the power and the resources given by God for a season to give people riches. So that alone does not prove whether a person is of God. So I'm going to read this Bible verse again. If any man teaches otherwise, excuse me, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. So here we have a Bible verse saying, and I know the money hungry, greedy, prosperity, false prophets preach that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And they say steal as if the devil's going to steal the money. But what, let me tell you this. Let me ask you this. Do you believe the devil's more concerned about stealing someone's faith or stealing their money? The devil's more concerned about stealing their faith because he knows if he steals their faith, they can't be saved. But if he steals their money, now they no longer have money to depend on, and they have to depend on God. So sometimes the devil will actually steal from us by giving us money and resources. So the, the, so the Lord makes poor and makes rich, which means that God has the power and sometimes makes a rich person poor. 
God has the power to take a person who's powerful in this world and bring them down low. Now, why would God do that? God would do that to save their soul. Because if they're depending too much on their money, too much on their power in the natural, too much on their resources, that they turn their back on God and they feel like they are God... Because of how much money they have, God, because of his infinite wisdom and love, will actually take the money from that person to save their soul. So that as the person loses their God, which is money, they cry out in, they cry out in pain. They cry out in desperation, and then God will be right there to rescue them. So this is a third sign of an indication of a false prophet. He has or she has the love of money. The fourth sign or indication of a false prophet is a false prophet will try to steal God's glory. King David said, touch not the Lord's anointed. Now in that sense, he said, don't do no harm to God's anointed, God's chosen people. But the devil will not only try to touch God's anointing, he will try to steal credit for what God is doing. In other words, God causes a homeless person to get delivered from drugs, get delivered from alcohol, God will give this person a job, a house, a car, and raise a homeless person from nothing to being a respected citizen in this life. God did it. And then a false prophet will come along and, and remove the credit from God, remove the glory from God, remove the divine intervention from God, and the false prophet will try to make that homeless person who is now no longer homeless say that you did it yourself. It was by your wisdom, it was by your strength, it was by your powers, by your uh, motivation, your will. Your self-control, your mental aptitude, they will try to steal God's credit, steal God's glory. That is another major red flag, another major uh, indication that you're dealing with a false prophet. They will try to steal God's glory. They won't give God credit for nothing. And remember, something that is glorious is something that other people don't do. All right. Why is it that Jesus has glory when he died on the cross? Other people died on the cross like Jesus. There was a thief to the left and to the right of him. So the glory of Jesus is not that he died on the cross because there were hundreds and thousands of people that died on the cross just like Jesus did. Jesus' glory is not that he was beaten, not that he was falsely accused, not that he was stabbed in the side because that happened to millions of people. So it can't be as glory glory. See, glory is something that no one else has. If you can bench press 100 pounds and everyone that walks in the gym can bench press 100 pounds, then nobody has any glory. But if you can bench press 100 pounds and someone comes in and bench presses 500 pounds, now some the person that did greater has the glory because he's above everyone else. Well, Jesus' glory did not come from dying in the cross alone. Jesus' glory did not come from suffering alone because a lot of people suffered. Jesus' glory came from who he is. Is. Who he is is a man of God, a child of God, a son of God, the Lamb of God that was born from a virgin. Who else do you know that was born from a virgin? Only Jesus. That is his glory. Who else do you know that died without sin? That was Jesus and Jesus alone. That is his glory. The glory of Jesus that he was the sacrifice. He paid the price for our sins and he had no sin in him. He was born of a virgin and no one else was born of a virgin. All the other stuff that Jesus did, the healing the blind, the raising the dead, the miracles, other men of God have done those things too. And you're going to have masses of false prophets try to steal the glory of God. And in stealing the glory of God, they will present themselves as they too are without sin. A false prophet will never share his testimony because he doesn't have one. If he had a testimony of Jesus, then he probably wouldn't be a false prophet. 
So this is another indication of uh, recognize a false prophet that he will not give any credit to Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 14 I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. So here you have a scripture of an example of Satan when he went from Lucifer an angel an anointed angel to becoming a demonic fallen angel when he tried to raise up or raise to become equal with God he was trying to steal God's glory number five the fifth sign of a false prophet is a, fi a, a, a false prophet will have a hidden agenda that he will not share with other people. There will be something that he is up to that he will m not make known to the congregation or that he will not make known to public, ge the general public. Because if the people know what he's really up to, they won't follow him. And let me tell you this. These hidden agendas take place in all assets of life. Whether you realize it or not. I'm talking about in the legal, in the legal field with the court systems and the political systems. The people in the politics, they have hidden agendas that they're not sharing with you. Because if they shared with you, they wouldn't be able to bring them to pass because we would try to stop them. Even in the uh, legal system, they have hidden agendas that they're doing that the general public never finds out. People that are in control of the news and the media, they have hidden agendas that they're up to that they don't share with the general population because if we knew, we'd try to stop them. And I'm going to say the same thing is true with the false prophets that are proclaiming to be pastors proclaiming to be men or women of God. They have hidden agendas that they're not going to share with the general congregation or they would try to stop them. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, he spoke unto you, and he says, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. So this is one of the hidden agendas of a false prophet, is that he will try to get the people that are, uh, that are watching him, that he has an audience with, he will try to indirectly or secretly get them to serve other gods. What is an example of another god? It could be a car, it could be a house, it could be a woman, it could be a man, it could be money. Try to make people follow other gods. You shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And let me tell you that these false prophets will be given the ability by Satan and the permission by God to prophesy and their prophecy will come to pass. The Bible says that these false prophets will be given power to perform many signs and wonders. They will actually have the ability to actually perform great, miraculous, spectacular signs and wonders and do things so that they will be able to deceive masses of people. So if someone comes and raises the dead or someone comes and heals the blind, or someone does a great work, that great work in itself does not prove that that's a man of God. That just proved that they did a great work. We don't know whether that great work was funded by Jesus Christ or by Satan until we look and inspect to see if that person has the fruit of the Spirit. We do not know a false prophet from a real prophet by their gifts which means their, their ability to preach, their ability to teach.
their ability to heal. We don't know whether that's a false prophet or a true prophet by the gift alone. We know whether it's a false prophet or a true prophet by the fruits of the Spirit. Do they have love? Do they have gentleness? Do they have meekness? Do they have humility? Those are, and do they have peace? Do they have joy? Those are indications of the fruit of the Spirit, which means they are connected and plugged in to Jesus Christ. In verse 3, you shall not hearken unto their words, unto the words of that prophet and the dreamer of the dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Number six sign of a false prophet, a, pro a false prophet has to and must speak smooth. I'm going to tell you, be honest, are you going to be deceived or misled by a hooping, hollering, screaming, crazy madman? Or are you just going to immediately shut down and not listen to anything that they say? I'm going to tell you those that are more likely of God are the pastors screaming and yelling and hooping and hollering because they ain't deceiving nobody. <laughs> The false prophet is going to be the one to speak. He's going to speak so smooth and so manipulative. And I often try to advise or counsel women in the sense to know a man who is no good is a man who always speaks smooth to them. A man who always speaks kind. Because in reality, men have bad days. Men have hard times. And out of their hard times and bad days, they're going to get mad. They're going to get angry. They're going to get upset. So a person who is covering that up and hiding that is a person who's up to something. So a person who's always speaking smooth and always speaking charismatic and soft, that's a person who probably has a hidden agenda and he's going to manipulate someone. In Luke chapter 6 verse 26, it says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. So did their fathers to the false prophets. In Lamentations, it says the visions of your prophets were false and worthless. They did not expose your sin toward to ward off your captivity. The oracles they gave you were false and misleading. So in other words, these false prophets will never talk about sin. These false prophets will never mention hell. These false prophets will never mention, mention consequences for sin because they don't want people to get free. They only wanted to encourage them. They only want to make them feel good and they only want to mislead them so they end up um, pointing people into the direction of hell without them realizing it. Because a true prophet speaks harsh. A true prophet prophet warns people of their sin so that they could be aware of their sin so that they can feel not condemned but convicted of their sin so that they can have a chance and an opportunity to repent of their sin so that they can have a chance and an opportunity to get saved and be forgiven of their sin not cover up their sin not excuse their sin and not deny their sin like the false prophets try to get the congregation to do a true prophet will expose the sin and shine the light on the sin so that souls can be saved. And a false prophet makes a lot of friends because he tells people what they want to hear not what they need to hear. And the truth is, no matter who you are, no matter what your title is, no matter how long you've been serving God, you have sinned. And you are going to sin again. And when you sin again, we need to shine the glorious light of the gospel on our sin so that we can repent of our sin and be forgiven of our sin and be free from the consequences of our sin. And that process is not always a smooth process. That process does not always feel good to our flesh or our pride. The seventh sign or indication of a false prophet is hypocrite. Here you have a man as blue as he wanted to be as blue.